Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the CSDS 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, this third conference on statistics and data science has been organized in collaboration with the Federal University of Bahia. Its purpose is to bring together researchers, practitioners from the academy and from the industry that develop and apply statistical and computational methods for data science. This conference will provide an environment to share and discuss ways to improve access to knowledge and promote interdisciplinary collaborations. The scientific program will be very appealing for most statisticians and data scientists inter interested in quantitative methods for decision making and will include plenary talks, short courses, roundtables, and contributed posters. Together with the third conference on statistics and data science, the initial projects of the second class of specialization of data science and big data of the Federal University of Bahia will be presented and discussed. You can find the links for all sessions and all posters in the conference website. We would like to thank local, national, international institution, institutions that endorse this conference and help make the organization of this event possible. The Federal University of Bahia, the specialization in data science and big data, the ABE, Brazilian Statistical Association, the RBRAS, Brazilian Region of the International Biometric Society, the ASA, American Statistical Association, CONRI-3, Conselho Regional de Estatística da Terceira Região, CONRI-5, Conselho Regional de Estatística da Quinta Região, the ISBIS, the International Society for Business and Industrial Statistics, the ISI, the International Statistical Institute, in the special interest group on data science from the, the International Statistical Institute. We are also grateful to our national and international guests who participate as plenary speakers, short course presenters, discussants in roundtables, and presenters of contributed posters, and of course, to all participants. We will now compose the opening table, and for that, we invite Professor Lisandra Fabio, Chair of the Organizing Committee of the CSDS 2021. Professor Giovanna Silva, head of the Department of Statistics of the Federal University of Bahia. Professor Evandro Santos, Dean of the Institute of Mathematics and Statistics of the Federal University of Bahia. Professor Thierry Lobon, Research Coordinator of the Federal University of Bahia on behalf of the Rector. and Professor Paulo Canas Rodrigues, Chair of the Scientific Program Committee of the CSDS 2021. I would like now to invite everybody to listen to the national anthem, which will be sung by the singer Raiza Soares. Oh, Father, Mother, tus filhos deixem só. 
Thank you, Raj. Now, to welcome you, we will hear from... I would like to share... Oh, sorry about that. To welcome you, we will hear from the chair of the local organizing committee of the third conference on statistics and data science, Professor Lisandra Fabio. Good morning. First, I'd like to express my gratitude to present authorities for accepting my invitation to participate in this open ceremony. And on behalf of the local organizing committee, I would like to welcome all of you to the third conference on statistics and data science in a virtual format this time. We believe that this meeting will provide the exchange of knowledge between us and that represent an advance in statistics and data science locally, nationally and internationally. Locally, we have an extra motivation to organize this conference because our Department of Statistics has a very successful specialization in data science and big data, which filled in all vacancies with a long wait list. The third class is expected to start in September of 2022. Nationally and internationally, there has been a general movement on the statistical community towards the needs of data science, both in terms of research and education. More discussion on these topics will be take place in the round table in this conference. In the last few months, we have been working hard to provide you with a great scientific program that includes six great keynote speakers, five short courses, two round tables, and the contributed the posters. I hope you enjoy the third conference on statistics and data science, and that you will be able to visit us in Salvador very soon. If you have any questions or need any help, please contact me or one of the members of our team. Thank you all for being present and welcome to the third conference on statistics and data science. Thank you. And now I will over to the head of the Department of Statistics of the Federal University of Bahia, Professor Giovanna Silva. Bom dia a todos e todas. Good morning. Desejo a todos né, um bom evento e de maneira especial agradeço né, a comissão, tanto organizadora quanto a comissão científica, pelo, pelo trabalho, né, pelo excelente evento que organizaram. Espero no próximo evento já estarmos no, no presencial para nos vermos. Então, bom, bom evento a todos. E now I will over to the Dean of the Institute of Mathematics and Statistics of the Federal University of Bahia, Professor Evandro Santos. Good morning, everyone. Bom dia a todos. Eu fico muito satisfeito quando vejo a universidade, a universidade pública de modo geral, é, se reinventar e apesar, em, apesar dos momentos de crise, de dificuldades, é, Dá, dá início a um evento dessa magnitude. Esse evento que surgiu, está na terceira edição, então é um evento recente, mas não é um evento pequeno. Aliás, esse evento nunca foi pequeno. Já na primeira edição, nós tínhamos contabilizado participantes de pelo menos três continentes. E agora nós estamos vendo que esse número só aumenta, a quantidade de atividades só aumenta, o que me dá muito orgulho de ser diretor do Instituto e ser colega de vocês e estar nessa universidade que a cada dia mostra mais e mais. Se reinventa para crescer, para mostrar que pode. Se tivéssemos, tivéssemos mais recursos, faríamos com certeza muito mais. É, eu, eu gostaria de parabenizar o Departamento de Estatística, parabenizar os organizadores na figura do professor Paulo e na professora Lisandra. Tá? Agradecer a Thierry pela presença, pela, pelo apoio. E espero que o próximo evento eu possa convidá-los para conhecer melhor nossa cidade, nosso estado. E, como disse a professora Giovana, eu espero que no próximo evento, ano que vem, estaremos aqui em Salvador, 
compartilhando e desfrutando a nossa cidade e a nossa universidade. Um grande abraço a todos e bom evento. Obrigado. E agora, a word over to the research coordinator of the Federal University of Bahia, on behalf of the rector, professor Thierry Lobão. Bom dia a todos. Eu gostaria de cumprimentar os meus colegas de mesa, a professora Alessandra, a professora Giovana, o professor Evandro, fazer um cumprimento também ao professor Paulo, é, e dizer que, em nome de nossa universidade, do nosso reitor, o professor João Carlos Salles, que infelizmente não pode estar aqui conosco, por problema de agenda que todos conhecem, agradecer pelo convite para estarmos presentes nessa abertura e dar as boas-vindas a todos os participantes desta terceira edição da Conferência em Estatística e Ciência de Dados. Observando a lista de palestrantes e as atividades das sessões destes três dias de encontro, eu estou seguro de que teremos uma ótima oportunidade para trocarmos experiências e de que o evento será um grande sucesso. É, nos tempos duros em que estamos vivendo, eventos como esse são um alento, pois demonstram que, apesar dos esforços de alguns para desacreditar a ciência, e nos levar ao atraso e desespero, a nossa comunidade científica é forte, e eles não passarão, e a cultura e a inteligência permanecerão. Now, since there are a lot of participants that come from abroad, I will translate something that I said. It's a great, it's a great pleasure on behalf of our president, Professor John Carlos Salles, who unfortunately was not able to be here, to address my greeting to all the participants of the third conference on statistics and data science. I am completely sure that we shall have an excellent meeting. Although in this awful virtual form, I have to confess to you, Ms. Andre, I am really tired with all this virtual stuff. But so I take the opportunity to invite all of you to come in flesh and blood to the fourth conference and visit our beautiful city. Thank you. And now, a word over to the chair of the scientific program committee of the third conference on statistics and data science, Professor Paulo Canas Rodrigues. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, you are, uh, you are now. Uh, I would like to, to welcome all of you on the behalf of the Scientific Program Committee uh, to, the, to the third conference on statistics and data science. This is the third edition of this conference. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we have it online, but there are also advantages on that. So for this edition, uh, we were yesterday looking at the list of re registrations. We had almost 1,500 registered participants. So this is a, a number that it will be very difficult to, to, to have on, on site if it was presential. The, the organization of this meeting has been carried out in collaboration with the Department of Statistics and the specialization on data science and big data of the Federal University of Bahia. Uh, and its purpose of this conference is to try to bring together researchers and practitioners from academy, academy and industry and to develop and apply statistical and computational methods for data science. This conference will provide a forum to share and discuss ways to improve uh, the access to knowledge and to promote interdisciplinary collaborations. Uh, of course, it is more difficult when we do it uh, um, online, but uh, the, the, the list of emails are, are available in the book of abstracts you can check it out and you can you can contact people in that way in the scientific program committee i uh, we are we are really pleased with it we have we have uh, six keynote speakers they are they are references worldwide on statistics and data science uh, we have five short courses of on 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 very important topics on on statistics and data sciences so we also will have two round tables one today and one tomorrow on data science on, and data science education, it, it will be that they will have discussions uh, which are which are leading scientists on on these fields, and we have one general poster session on on Saturday morning. We have one poster session session where the students of our specialization in data science and big data 
will present the initial projects that will be will be tomorrow um, and uh, the, the, the we also have, have uh, uh, the possibility we had the possibility for people to, to apply for students and young statisticians to apply for for an award we will um, we'll share the results in the closing session on, on Saturday. And uh, I, I would like to, to thank, uh, now it's time to thank, uh, I'd like to thank the, the colleagues in my in the, the, the opening table for their availability, Giovanna, uh, Thierry and Evandro for, for uh, taking a little bit of time from their agendas to be here with us. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the local organizing committee for, for all this, uh, the work that they, they, they have been doing. Uh, we also would like to thank all the institutions that, that were mentioned in the beginning that gave us financial support and endorsed this, this conference. And of course, we would like to thank the keynote speakers, the lectures for the short courses, the discussions in the round tables and the poster presenters. Uh, it's without their contribution, we could not have, have a, a, a conference. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and for attending the conference. All that we are doing is for you, is for, is for, is for you to, to take advantage of it and to, and to, and to enjoy. So we wish you an enjoyable stay, uh, unfortunately not in Salvador, uh, but uh, uh, I hope that next year we'll have the chance to have it uh, on site here in Salvador. Uh, in, it is a, indeed a beautiful city. So thank you, thank you all, and welcome to the third conference on statistics and data science. Now, we will show you a video about the beautiful city of Salvador, hoping that next year you can join us in person. Lugares são como pessoas. Tem aqueles que apenas passam por nossa vida e aqueles que deixam a sua marca. Tem aqueles sem graça e aqueles instigantes. É, lugares são como pessoas. Tem lugar que tem o um incrível poder de dar um clique na nossa alma. E quando a gente vê, já entrou no nosso coração e ele está ali, instalado. Salvador é assim. Uma festa para os sentidos. O gosto do dendê fica na boca, quase como uma tatuagem no paladar. O cheiro do mar não se contenta em ser sentido. O sal gruda no corpo e quer se misturar com o nosso suor. As imagens são tão carregadas de sentido que parecem ter sempre algo novo para lhe mostrar, mesmo que você já tenha visto dezenas de vezes. E a batida? Será que é por acaso que tem o mesmo nome daquilo que lá no peito faz a gente se sentir vivo? É, uma cidade que é dividida em duas partes e ligada por um elevador não nasceu mesmo para ser convencional. Aqui, o palco anda. E o mais impressionante, o povo sai andando atrás. Aqui, o banho pode ser de mar, mas se preferir, pode ser de pipoca também. É o coração da África, o berço do Brasil e tem o um sorriso que é do tamanho do mundo. Só quem nasceu de uma mistura pode juntar tão bem coisas tão diferentes. Salvador tem um santo do candomblé para cada dia da semana e uma igreja para cada dia do ano. Salvador é superlativa, generosa, bem-humorada e de bem com a vida. Não, não dá para ser o mesmo depois de conhecê-la. Não dá para ser igual depois de sentir suas sensações. Não dá para ser igual depois de perceber suas singularidades. Não dá para ser igual depois de sentir seus cheiros, ouvir seus sons, provar seus sabores. Não dá para ser igual depois de ouvir suas histórias. Não dá para ser igual depois de conhecer um lugar tão surpreendentemente diferente. Salvador, você sente que é diferente. And now, we will have the pleasure to listen to one well-known song from Bahia, performed by singer Raiza Soares. Hello, everyone. I wish you a great conference. My name is Raisa Soares, and today I am accompanied by Leandro Oliveira on 
the guitar. I am now going to sing a very special song from our Brazilian state of Bahia, related in Carnaval in Salvador. Its name is Baianidade Nago. Já pintou verão, calor no coração, a festa vai começar. Salvador se agita e uma só alegria, eterno Dodô e Osmar. Na Avenida 7, da Paz o Sotiete, da Barra ao Farol a brilhar. Carnaval na Bahia, oitava maravilha, nunca irei te deixar, meu amor. Thank you, Heidi Soares. At this moment, we are now concluding this session. We are grateful to the members of the opening table. Now, we would like to invite you to the opening lecture by Professor Ronald Wasserstein, Executive Director of the American Statistical Association. And to present and chair this session of the Honorable Speaker, we invite Professor Paulo Canas Rodrigues. So good morning, everyone, again. Um, it, is, it is indeed a, a, a great pleasure for, for me to, to introduce Ron, uh, Ronald Wasserstein. Uh, he will be the opening keynote speaker. Uh, and uh, I, I actually invite Ron for, for coming to, to come to Brazil in, the, in, in 2018 and 2019. Unfortunately, he couldn't come. Personally, I hope he can, he can come next year. Um, Ronald Wasserstein is the executive director of the American Statistical Association. Uh, is, uh, he assumed the top ASA leadership in 2007. In this role, Wasserstein provides executive leadership and management for the association and is responsible for ensuring that the ASA fulfills its mission to promote the practice and profession of statistics. He also is responsible for a staff of 36 at the ASA headquarters in Alexandria, in VA. Uh, as executive director, Wasserstein uh, also is the official ASA spokesperson. Prior to joining ASA, Wasserstein was a, mat uh, it was, uh, a mathematics and statistics in mathematics and statistics department faculty member and administrator at Washburn University in Top Topeka uh, from 84 to 2007. During his last seven years at the school, he served as university vice president for academic affairs. Wasserstein is a long time member of the American Statistical Association, having joined the association in 1983 
and has been active as a volunteer in the ASA for more than 20 years. He twice served as president of the Council, Council, Council's Western Missouri chapter of the ASA. Wasserstein served as chair of the two ASA sections, the ASA section on statistical education and the ASA section on statistical consulting. He also shared the group, the, the Council of Chapters Governing Board in 2006. And as a, is a member of the ASA Board of Directors, he was from 2001 to 2003. Wasserstein is a fellow of the ASA and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was president, present, president, to join the uh, Ritchie Alumni Award. He was present, the joint Rich Alumni Award and the Muriel Clark Student Life Award from Washburn University. The Manning Distinguished Service Award from the North American Association of Summer Schools and the Google Merch uh, Distinguished Service Award from Kappa Mu Epsilon National Mathematics Honor Society. Ron and his wife, Sherry, live in North Virginia and enjoy jogging, movings, movies, uh, binge-watching TV series, uh, live theater, books, and doing uh, and doting uh, on their children and grandchildren. Uh, Ron, it is really a, a great pleasure and honor to, to have Ron here with me. Uh, I first met Ron back in 2010. Uh, I don't know if Ron remembers, we were in, in the International Symposium for, for Business and Industrial Statistics in Porto Ros, in Slovenia. Uh, in, in, in the conference, uh, I attended an half day development workshop, uh, it, which was especially focused on the needs of young statisticians. And this workshop was organized by Ron and also had the contribution from Sastri Pantula, which was the, the ASA president at, at that time. Uh, that was indeed a very special conference to me because it was a lot of first times for me. So uh, it was not only because I had the, the chance and pleasure of meeting Ron, but also because it represents the beginning of my service to the scientific com community and the start of my passion to do so. I had just started with Nick Fisher, the group of young business and industrial statisticians, the YBs. He had become its chair and the ESB's vice president, and also organized in that conference my first invite paper session. And uh, I was the first, for the first time, uh, a part of the scientific program committee in a, in a, in a conference. A lot of firsts happened there. Um, that was in 2010. And uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of my motivation for, for, for doing this kind of contribution to the profession was, uh, was coming from Ron's workshop. So I really thank you very much, Ron, for, for all your leadership, all your, your motivation that, that, you, that you always bring to people. It is really, really a great pleasure for, to have you here. Thank you very much, Ron. Please, now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paolo. And I remember the uh, conference very well and I'm grateful uh, for all that you are doing for our profession. While I get my screen shared, I want to thank you for having me again. I also want to say that um, I can't imagine ever seeing a video that would make me want to um, come somewhere as the video that you showed. That was... Um, that was truly fabulous. I'm um, going to apparently do something different with my chair. Just one second. But yes, I uh, also not been to too many places that were any more um, lovely than the um, that city was, uh, Porto Roche. So um, no panic. Hello, I'm just having a little bit of trouble getting uh, the screen share to show my, give me the choice for my slide. Going to do That's it. okay. That's okay. It is going to work, though. I am uh, that. There we go. That time it's happy. 
All right. So uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for being part of this conference, and especially thank you for um, allowing me to spend a little time with you to talk about a subject that I have a great deal of passion about. Uh, Paolo, I uh, can only see my slides, which is great, uh, but I, I can't see you or me or anyone else. So if there's a problem, just feel free to jump in and let me know. Otherwise, away we go. So I want you to begin with a little thought experiment. Here in the US, we're a, a little bit obsessed with our cars. And so I want you to imagine that we had at our fingertips, at our availability, the most amazing car ever. In this amazing car, it's it's beautiful car to look at. Um, somehow it violates the laws of physics and will run for three days on a rechargeable nine volt battery that recharges in an hour. So there's basically no downtime. It's amazingly inexpensive to purchase. Everyone has access to it. Everyone can get this car. Ah, one downside. It turns out to be difficult to drive. There's just crashes in it all the time. People can't People can't handle driving this car. Well, I'm making an analogy here to what I will call the 100-year test drive of the concept of statistical significance, um, made uh, well-known beginning in uh, with Fisher's book in 1925. And almost ever since the idea of statistical significance came along, there's been concerns about it. To give you some idea of the amount of time over which uh, there has been concern. There's this paper by uh, world famous statistician, uh, uh, David Cox, Sir David Cox, I guess I should say. And he wrote that's been widely felt probably for 30 years and more that significance tests are overemphasized and often misused and that emphasis should be put on estimation and prediction. And he wrote that in 1986. So if we take 30 years away from 1986, we get to 1956, and well, I'll just own up. That's that's the year of my birth. So for at least my whole lifetime, my whole 65 years, this has been an issue. Looking back even before my birth, there's this book by um, uh, Fred Mosteller, and he wrote that the main purpose of a significance test is to inhibit the natural enthusiasm of the investigator. In 1963, uh, a well-known statistician at the time, Cherry Clark, wrote this paragraph that you see here, and I'll just emphasize the second part of it. Significance tests do not provide the information that scientists need, and furthermore, they are not the most effective method for analyzing and summarizing data. And one more, this is from an article in 1994 with the clever title, The Earth is Round, P less than 0.05. Jacob Cohen writes, what's wrong with null hypothesis significance testing? Well, among many other things, it does not tell us what we want to know. And we so much want to know what we want to know that out of desperation, we nevertheless believe that it does. We convince ourselves that, that significance testing works in ways that it really does not. So, the point here is that some of the things I'm going to discuss today are not at all a new emphasis, but we're trying to renew the focus on the problem. And getting back to the car analogy, I just want to say that at some point we have to realize that if the car keeps getting wrecked, more training, more training, more training is not going to do the trick. People have argued all these decades that, well, the problem really isn't with the tool, the problem is with people not being able to use it well. So we just need to teach them better. But sooner or later, you start to realize that that's just not going to be uh, the problem. A quantification of this appeared in a, a, an ASA journal that I'll talk about more uh, later. But um, in this article, Ray Hubbard was that on the one hand, the number of citations of articles that warn people about problems with statistical significance has grown over the last six decades, over the course of my life. More people are citing the problems, and yet at the same time, more people are also using that tool. And 
um, not very effectively in many cases. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a warm up. Let's back up a minute and, and make sure that we all get on the same page here by talking about very briefly what is a p-value. So in the ASA statement on p-values and statistical significance that I'll say more about in a few minutes, we offered an, an informal definition saying that the p-value is the probability under a specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data, for example, the sample mean difference between two compared groups, would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. We thought that was a simple, straightforward definition, but a reporter said that it was about as clear as mud. Okay, so you, you can't please everyone. We could have gone this way. This is a uh, technical definition of a p-value. And maybe for some people in this audience, this is a useful definition. Most of us who aren't um, thinking about measure theory all the time, not quite so much. So what is a p-value? Well, instead of um, hassling over definitions, let's just uh, walk through a description instead. We're investigators and we know some things and we want to know more things because we're curious. So we design an experiment to help us know more things. We collect data from that experiment. We numerically summarize the results of that experiment, and then we try to figure out what we know as a result. Well, in that numerical summary part, we summarize the data into a number that we call a statistic. We compute the probability, we compute a probability from that statistic, and that's what the p-value is. It's a probability value. And if the p-value is small enough, then we say that it is statistically significant. And what is small enough? Well, for historical reason, that has uh, typically been set to be 0 0.05. So a quick, quick example, again, to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, this is from the uh, Public Library of Science um, Medicine. The, there was a new treatment uh, being compared to a placebo to improve TKV, that is, total kidney volume, I don't know anything about total kidney volume, but it's a measure of health in kidney patients and it's measured in milliliters. So after one year, the difference in the median total kidney volume, that is the difference between the median difference between the treatment and placebo was 96.8 milliliters. Um, and there is a rather wide 95% confidence interval for that measurement. So we're just going to uh, take, uh, oh, so the value turned out to be 0.027, which we will round off to 0.03 for this discussion. Okay, so that's an example that we'll use as we go forward here in the next few minutes. So I want to zero in on that 0.03. That's the value. How did we, how did we get that number? Well, to get a p-value, you have to assume a bunch of things. The key assumption, the well-known assumption, the one that everybody thinks about that does this, is that we assume in this case that there's no difference between the treatment and the placebo. And it's important that you hear those words, that we, we compute this p-value on the assumption that there's no difference between the two. We also have to assume a bunch of other things that if I had more time, we'd get into. They're important uh, and they're often ignored. All right, so we have this 0.03. What does it mean? Well, there's no difference between the treatment and the placebo. And if all those other things I talked about uh, uh, are also true, all those other assumptions, then the difference, uh, then the probability that we would observe the difference that we found, that 97 milliliters or an even larger difference, is 0.03. The um, the p-value is often misinterpreted. It's misinterpreted all the time in dozens of ways. I'll illustrate for you uh, some examples, although I don't have time to sh show what the problem with each one is. But for example, a p-value of 0.03, some people will say there's only a point, or only a 3% chance that the placebo was better than the treatment. Nope. There's only 3% chance of getting the result that we did by chance alone. Sorry, that's not all, that's also wrong. The probability that the null hypothesis is false is 97%. We can't 
uh, measure the probability of the null hypothesis at all with um, being false with this uh, this way here. Um, and uh, dot, 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 because there's literally a couple dozen common misinterpretations. So what can we conclude? All right. So we could have had really bad luck in our sample or one or more of our assumptions was wrong, including the one that we assumed about the treatment and the placebo being no different. So now you're going to find out the, the reason why um, Paolo invited me to this conference, why he, uh, I'm coming live from the Washington, D.C. area to show you my vast expertise. It's right on this slide. 0.03 is smaller than 0.05. There you go. That's the kind of expertise I bring to you. So we call that statistically significant. Why? Well, this goes all the way back to R.A. Fisher, who I mentioned earlier. He's the first person to use the word significant to describe this phenomenon. And he meant that to say that the result was worthy of further scrutiny. That means it should be looked at more carefully. You know, all of us love to use the undo button on our computer. They help us fix a lot of things that um, that are harder to correct without it. And those of us who are old enough to remember times before the undo button especially appreciate the undo button. And if Fisher had an undo button for his life, he would probably have used it based on his later writings. He would probably have used it to undo calling this significant because... The word means more than um, than he meant it to. It has, in common language, a different meaning than um, he intended. It means something very different than worth further scrutiny. Now, I don't know how significant translates in the language that's uh, that's your um, birth language, but let me just talk about it in English a little bit by talking about opposites of significant. Now, remember the point I'm trying to make is that the word significant means something different in common language than Fisher intended for it. So opposites of significant are insignificant, unimportant, meaningless. Those words sound way more than the opposite of worth further scrutiny. We could think about significant as an adjective. You could have a significant increase. That could be good if it's in your paycheck. You could have a significant event like a wedding uh, uh, or um, a baptism. We even say in English a significant other to refer to someone with whom we have a, uh, a close personal, uh, perhaps romantic relationship. Now, for those of you who... Um, uh, speak a fair amount of English, I would like you to think about the word mole and just think about what that word means to you in English, the first thing it means, okay? Because it's one of those words that has lots of very different unrelated meanings. For example, a mole can be this creature that digs around in your backyard and makes holes. A mole can be a, a particularly well-placed spy. A mole can be a skin blemish. And if you're uh, a scientist, you know that a, a mole is a, um, a measure in, in, um, in chemistry as well. But the thing is that when we use the word mole in a sentence, it's never going to be confusing. You're not going to think you're talking about one of these things when you're talking about the other if you have the context. Significant is not a word like that. Um, and I don't know whether this movie, uh, The Princess Bride, um, is popular in Brazil or not. But he has a great phrase in there. Uh, one of the characters says, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And that's what happens with the word significant. A few years ago, there's a, a, a wonderful article written in Scientific America uh, about seven misused scientific words. For example, the word hypothesis is a proposed explanation that
that can be tested. We talk in common language all the time about a hypothesis. Um, I have a hypothesis as to why your mother doesn't like me. Well, that just means I have a guess. I have an idea, but it's not something that can rigorously be tested. The word theory is an explanation of some aspect of the natural world that has been substantiated through repeated experiments or testing. A theory isn't just something that you're sitting around and you come up with an idea and you claim that that's your theory, at least not in the scientific technical definition of the word. And word number six in the seven misused scientific words is the word significant. Now, I have an example for you that will work if, um, if you have Tinder in, in Brazil, and you're going to have no idea what I'm talking about if you don't, and I apologize. Um, but let's imagine that instead of looking for a, a person in Tinder, you're looking for a p-value. And you stumble across the p-value 0.03 that we, that we discovered uh, a little bit ago. And you have to make a decision. And in, um, you, you need to uh, decide whether you're going to swipe right or not to indicate that you, you're interested in that p-value, that it's worth further scrutiny. And if you do that, the, you're saying something more like this, that the results are interesting. You should look at it some more. Maybe you should repeat the experiment. Could be onto something, but it's going to take more time. But if you don't understand Tinder, um, it's the same as if you don't understand p-values, and that is that you could come to a very wrong conclusion. Your right swipe may be a, practically a marriage proposal because you're putting all your faith in that p-value, and you're going to publish, and you're going to get grants because you have your wonderful p-value of 0.03, which is less than 0.05, the magical number. So. You may think I'm getting a little bit carried away here, and perhaps you are right. But I want to show you some things that have appeared in the literature for people who got a p-value of 0.06, a little bigger than 0.05, and they feel like they need to explain themselves. So these are scientific literature quotes, okay? So they people will say something like, almost significant, almost attained significance almost significant tendency, almost became significant, almost but not quite significant, almost statistically significant, almost reached statistical significance, just barely below the level of significance, just beyond significance, missed it by that much. Remember that these are all people who are trying to explain something simply because the number they got is a little bit bigger than the magic number. All right, these people have more explaining to do because they have a bigger p-value, something around 0.08. So you'll see a trend in these things, a certain trend toward significance, a definite trend, a slight tendency toward significance, a strong trend toward significance, a trend close to significance, an expected trend, approached our criteria of significance, approaching borderline significance, approaching although not reaching significance. Okay, now, finally, the people who have a really tough problem because they got a p-value that was very close to 0.05, but didn't quite get there, hovered at a nearly significant level, hovers on the brink of significance, just about significant, just above the margin of significance, just at the conventional level of significance. Because, you know, they needed all those decimal points just barely statistically significant, okay, rounding, I guess, just borderline significant, just escaped significance, just, just got out the door somehow, and just failed significance. I want to be very clear at this point. I am not making fun of the people who wrote these things. They are researchers, scientists like you and me, but they have a problem that has been imposed on them. It's not a scientific problem. It's not that there's 
something greatly different about their results if they get a P of 0.051 versus if they get a P of 0.049. It's that they are forced to deal with a essentially arbitrary line of 0.05 at which on one side of the line it means something and just on the other side of the line it means something else. There's a whole bunch of these quotes available at this website and of course I will I will share these um, slides with anyone who wants them. I mentioned earlier that the ASA uh, in 2016 created a statement on statistical significance and p-values. And that statement had six principles in it. You see the principles here. I'm only going to um, focus on one of those today. And that is number three, scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. But just for completeness, here are the other uh, uh, three of the six principles, and um, and and I think they're they're pretty common sense. Though the last one may not be as well understood. The biggest thing that I think you can take away from the ASA statement on p-values and statistical significance is that bright line thinking is bad for science. And what I mean by that is that it's imagining that there's a bright line for p-values that on one side of the line it means something and right on the other side of the line it means something else um like as though um you were as though it's the, a um, a state border and on one side of the line you're in one state and on the other side of the line you're in another state that's a real border but this is an arbitrary border and here is what um, uh, distinguished statistician ken rothman says about that. He says that scientists have embraced and even avidly pursued meaningless differences solely because they are statistically significant and ignored important effects because they failed to pass the screen of statistical significance. That is, they just got kicked out because they weren't, they weren't less than 0.05. He says it's a safe bet that people have suffered or died because scientists and editors, regulators, journalists, and others have used significance test to interpret results and have consequently failed to identify the most beneficial courses of action. That's pretty powerful stuff. So I come here to you to argue that it's time for a change. It's time to move on. And I, along with many other colleagues, argue this point in a special issue of the American Statistician in 2019 uh, that's full of articles about this issue and has a lead editorial that I wrote with my colleagues, Alan Sherm and Nicole Lazar, called Moving to a World Beyond P Less Than 0.05. And we say it's time to say goodbye to it. The 100-year test drive of statistical significance is just not working out. Now, why? Well, I'm just going to summarize what I've uh, showed you so far and add a couple of things. So I've argued that significance has lost its meaning, that it's not what it was Fisher meant it to be. It's used in the wrong way um, in, in science all the time. I've shown you that bright lines lead to bizarre behavior, people trying to explain themselves in ways that they shouldn't have to. I um, showed you that uh, uh, in an early slide that decades of complaining, of warning people about this have made no change. In fact, we argue that uh, in the uh, editorial that I referred to a moment ago, that a label of statistical significance adds nothing. It gives you no more information than what was already conveyed in the value of P. And I haven't talked about, but will very briefly, something called the file drawer effect. The file drawer effect, um, one way to look at it could be, uh, could be like this. So imagine that there is a treatment for, you know, um, uh, a rash or something like that, that, uh, uh, that, that doesn't work. Okay. It just doesn't work. And so imagine then further that we do 100 studies of this treatment using P less than 0.05 as our, um, as our threshold. Well, then on average, five of these studies will show that the, that the treatment works. 
And the other 95% of the studies will go into a, a file drawer of things that did not work. Well, what happens then is the, um, the five percent, the five studies get published, and then essentially there's a 100 percent error rate um, in in the literature. Uh, so a lot more to say about that. Not enough time. Okay, I need to take a moment before I continue to um, clarify and make a disclaimer. Okay, not talking about getting rid of p-values. For some reason, there's a lot of people who hear. Uh, this message and think that we're talking about getting re rid of p-values. Nope, it's about it's all about the arbitrary threshold of p less than 0.05. And I also need to be clear that while yes, I am the executive director of the American Statistical Association, I'm speaking for myself today. Um, the 2016 ASA statement that I showed you bits of a moment ago is a statement of the association. Other things are not. The editorial that I co-wrote all those 43 articles in the American Statistician Special Issue, those are not official statements of the ASA. There's also a recently uh, published, a uh, couple months ago, a task force uh, statement on um, statistical significance and reproducibility. Uh, that's also important, but not an official statement of the ASA. All right, now I wanna get to the heart of this. Why does it matter? All this stuff that I'm talking about, is it just, um, is it just uh, academic worrying foolishness? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two examples. One is trivial. It doesn't affect the, the world in any way. And the other one is very much different than that. So a few years ago, there was a phenomenon, I think it's still around to a certain extent, of about something called power posing. Power posing is the idea that if you, uh, if you, if you assume certain physical postures, it can help you have more uh, assertiveness, more confidence, etc. Et it was made famous by this TED Talk, um, Your Body Language May Shape Who You Are, you can see that it, it's been viewed, you know, over 50 million times. And the idea is that if you hold, like, say, like, say, you know, I was real nervous maybe before giving this talk. And so before I got online with you, I assumed a certain posture for two minutes. And then that posture is supposed to supposedly from this study, it's going to make me feel more confident, more powerful, more willing to take risks. Um, because, and here's the key two words in there, in that middle bullet, found statistically significant changes in testosterone and cortisol levels in people who used high power poses versus those who used low power poses. Well, what are we talking about here? This is a high power pose, according to the study. All right. And these are also high power poses. The one on the right um, is actually got a name. It's called the Wonder Woman pose. These are also high power poses as well. Okay, they reflect relaxation. They reflect confidence. These are low power poses, much less confident. This is supposed to be somehow the lowest power pose of all. Well, what went wrong? I mean, this was a study that when it was, it came out, then people tried to reproduce it and they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't get the same results at all. It just didn't reproduce. And, and arguably it's because too much dependence on statistical significance. When you get a result that is super counterintuitive, that all it takes to improve your confidence, to bring up your, 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 the chemicals in your body is standing a certain way for two minutes. For Before you're ready to believe that, you should do more study. You shouldn't base it only on one study. So the problem here is that these weren't people who were trying to trick people or whatever. These are serious scientists. But when you're dealing with human beings, it's noisy data. It's a 
you can't just rely on the results of one experiment. Okay, the world isn't going to change by because of um, uh, whether we use power poses or don't or whatever. But here is something much more serious. Um, there's a, a, um, a clonal antibody, a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. That's uh, called aducanumab. It's now on the market as aduhelm. And uh, I don't know how Alzheimer's uh, translates into, into your uh, language. Maybe it's the same word, but it's a very serious disease. Um, it's, it's, it's a terrible disease. And here is the plot. Here is the story about this drug that I want to share with you. So you'll see where statistical significance comes in. So this drug has been shown to, re to remove these clusters in your brain that are called amyloid cr clusters, okay? And those build those buildups, those amyloid clusters have been associated with Alzheimer's disease. That is you, people with Alzheimer's show those clusters in their brain. So the question is whether if you got rid of those clusters, would it reduce the effects of Alzheimer's. If you could lessen them or get rid of them, would it reduce the effect? But so far, no drug has succeeded in reducing these effects. So the company Biogen stopped two simultaneous clinical trials on the effectiveness of this drug back in March of 2019 after futility analysis indicated that the study would not likely demonstrate efficacy. Excuse me. So they realized it's not working. Okay. But because of the nature of the study, you know, lots of trials going on all over the place, data continued to come on in from the study, even though the study itself had been stopped. So between December 2018, when the um, when the data when they essentially stopped doing the the the, the experiment. And March 2019, when um, when the trials were absolutely discontinued, there were um, 179. Well, there were 179 patients in uh, one arm of the study and 139 in the other that completed their 18 months of follow uh, follow up. And this is the um, the source for this information. A little bit more. So then. What happened was, now remember, the study stopped because we weren't getting statistically significant results, and it seemed clear in the futility analysis that we weren't going to get there, okay? But they did a subset analysis um, of the participants who received the full uninterrupted treatment. So they added back in these um, people and just looked at a subset of, the, of all the participants who got the whole thing for the whole 18 months. And in one of those two trials, they got to statistical significance. The higher dose led to a 23% less cognitive decline than a placebo after 78 weeks. Okay, don't have a confidence interval there, never saw one in print, but that's still, that's, that's pretty good. All right, 23%, that's pretty good. Um, although uh, there are other issues with how cognitive decline is measured that I don't have time to get into. But again, Statistical significance in one trial, in a subset analysis, and not in the other trial. And so then Biogen argued, well, that the difference in the results can be explained by a protocol change. And, you know, the problem is that this is a after-the-fact subgroup analysis. It's not the best place to focus on p-values. And, and I'll just say this much about that 23% and so on. The effect sizes themselves may not actually meet a threshold of clinical significance. That is to say that, that the amount of, of decline in cognitive impairment that was found in the 23% of people may be so small as to not even matter from a clinical standpoint, that, that you might not even notice that, um, that, the, that the person with Alzheimer's had made any improvement. But in 2021, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the use of this drug in spite of 
the um, the recommendation of an internal committee, and and why? Well, it's it's complicated like so many other things. But the bottom line is that there's no effective treatment for Alzheimer's, and people are desperate to to have one. Um, but some clinics are not allowing it to be used. Some insurance uh, uh, companies are not covering it, and 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 some hospitals are are not even administering it because of these results being so um, unclear. And it's an expensive uh, treatment. Uh, it's also important to know. So I am not privileged to know all of the internal workings of this. I'm not an expert. But of course, the internal committee that FDA had uh, are experts and did not recommend this. But what I'm trying to show you here is that that the focus on a arbitrary threshold creates a lot of problems. And, it, and now, because the drug's approved, the studies will go on, but it may be many years before we actually know what, um, whether this... Um, whether this uh, drug worked or not. So I argue that change is needed, but change is never easy. Um, and in this quote from Steve Goodman, he basically argues that p-values have essentially become these, the, uh, and statistical significance have become the scientific version of money, that you use them to get the things that you want. And that uh, if, if you can imagine trying to change your whole system of money, then you can imagine how difficult it is to change p-values or the use of p-values with respect to thresholds. So what do we do? What do, what do, what do we do instead? Well, um, that is, if we're telling everybody to stop using thresholds, what should we do? Well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but in this March 2019 special issue of the American Statistician, which is available online and is open access, you'll see some answers. But I think it starts with asking a question, a thought exercise. If you didn't, if you'd never heard of P less than 0.05, if that wasn't a thing, if Fisher had never butted it up, then what would you have to do to get your paper published your research grant funded, your drug approved, or your policy or business recommendation accepted. Well, we argue that there are five changes that could be taught that you could, that people could learn to do relatively easy. And to start with, instead of kicking off with your p-value, using the p-value and whether it's less than 0.05 or not, as your, as your highlight, as the main thing you focus on, in your paper and in your decision making, start instead with the effect size and with other measures of uncertainty, like, for example, uh, interval estimates. And then when you look at those interval estimates, focus on the substantive implications of those. So don't focus on whether the interval contains zero, for example, or one if you're looking at ratios or whatever, but whether each what the difference between the, the, the ends are. You saw that confidence interval that I showed uh, in the example at the start of this um, uh, with the total kidney volume. And it went from something like 11 to 190 milliliters. Well, I don't know anything about kidney volume, but my guess is that there's a lot of difference between those two things and that the, the, the 11 may, have, may still be valuable. Or maybe it isn't. And the, the 190 may be very valuable or maybe not. I don't know. That's where you bring your expertise in. That's where you talk about those things. We also suggest um, interpreting confidence intervals as compatibility intervals. That is to describe how compatible the data are with your hypothesized model. And again, these are these are things that matter. These are things that matter in how um, science is interpreted. So, for example, here is a trial where um, two antivirals were combined uh, to, to treat people in the hospitals who had severe COVID symptoms. Okay, so um, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last year, and 
the result was a mortality difference at 28 days of negative 5.8 percentage points. That is, um, 5.8 percent fewer people died within 28 days of being on this test um, uh, than people who just received the the placebo. Essentially, they got they got a drug uh, and standard care in the treatment group. They just got standard care in the other group. So, and that's a 95% confidence interval that runs somewhere from 17.3% fewer deaths, percentage points, fewer deaths, to 5.7% more. And so what always happens with these things is zero is in there. So we get a conclusion that looks like this, that there's no difference between the two, or, or the last part says no benefit was observed, okay? Well, that's um, not a conclusion that we should necessarily rush to because a 5.8 percentage point reduction in mortality is a, is a deal. So we can think about this in a different way. And again, I, I'm going through this fast, I know, so, so I, will leave, I will leave the slides. But instead, let's talk about uh, as as compatibility of our data with the model. Um, the, uh, so for example, we talk about the whole range of the confidence intervals, possible mortality differences that are highly compatible with our data, given our model, range from minus 17.3, which would be a very large decrease in mortality, to 5.7, which would be an increase in mortality. So why? Well, our trial was small. It included only 199 patients. All had severe COVID-19. And further study of this potentially effective treatment is needed. In other words, let's not just throw this out without further study. And then, as I will argue uh, here in just a moment, there's a whole bunch of other things that you should look at as well. And I'll show you what I mean. We recommend that um, presenting p-values, you present them as continuous, and I don't mean like with lots of digits, but you don't just, you show the p-value. You don't say whether, you don't just write it significant or not. You don't put it, you know, just put one asterisk, two asterisks, three asterisks. You report the p-value itself. You could also compute the p-value assuming something other than no difference between the treatment and the placebo. For example, you could figure out what the smallest difference between the treatment and the placebo would be that is meaningful, and then use that as your assumption for uh, computing the p-value. And finally, um, it's uh, important to interpret p-values as descriptive measures of compatibility with the model. And remember that p, the value of p is impacted by all those other assumptions that I referred to very briefly at the start of this talk. And, and so, yeah, the Tinder example um, shows us that we shouldn't rush to fall in love with a low p-value. Okay, and here's one more thing that we recommend, but it's harder, but it's probably the most important. And that is not to overemphasize the importance of the statistical measure, the p-value, or whatever, a Bayes factor or whatever it might be. Instead, to think about all the other scientific things that need to be thought about, prior evidence, how plausible is the mechanism that, how, how reasonable is it to assume that if I stand with my hands on my hips and my legs spread for two minutes before I come give this talk, that I'm gonna give a better talk? Focus on the study design and data quality on the real world costs and benefits of the, uh, the choices. And again, on how novel the finding is. If this is something brand new, it doesn't fit in with any previous science or whatever, it, it needs more scrutiny. And other factors vary depending on the area you're doing research in. Okay, so thanks for um, sitting with me for uh, 50 minutes or so. I'm wrapping up here by saying that we argue that it's time to stop using statistical significance as any kind of metric for scientific inference or teaching it as a fundamental concept. It's time to move on. 
we have uh, a lot of people have written about what a world beyond P less than 0.05 should look like. Again, P values are, are still useful. We're not saying throw out the P values. And all you folks are on the front line as you work with, um, with collaborators and so on, um, you have the opportunity to bring about a better practice of, um, of science. And so um, here's my uh, email address. The I'm uh, very easy to find um, uh, on the uh, on the internet. And uh, so thanks for giving me this opportunity. And now I'll stop sharing my screen and look forward to a few minutes of questions with you. Ron, thank you very much. It was it was really a pleasure. It was a it was a, a very nice class. We have we have some comments in the in the chat. Um, Clarice is, is saying good morning and saying hi. She, hey, she, she wrote it in, in the beginning. Hello. Good, good to see you. Good to see your name. And we have a lot of good mornings, a lot of congratulations. Um, we have here a comment from, uh, from Teresa. Hello. Thank you. Uh, let me find here. Uh, Teresa is saying that it was a precious, uh, precious lecture. Thanks very much. It, it is indeed. Uh, I have here a, a comment uh, from uh, Vinod Kumar. Um, can, yes, can, can you I read can the, yes, yes. it? Yes. Vinod, that's a great question. Um, so there are um, actually starting to be a few. Um, and if I had um, more time, but by that I mean like a whole nother hour, um, <laughs> we. Uh, I could show you what the like the New England Journal of Medicine is doing. So while progress is being made, the um, uh, um, I would say that you, it's still what the question you raise is still an issue. And I would say, you know, how do you how do you deal with this? Well, I think that you have to make good argumentation in your in your paper. Um, you have to bring out all those other things that um, that I was talking about. But in fairness, that's that's why we're writing about these things. That's why, you know, I'm happy to get up early in the morning to talk to you about them, because I do think change needs to be made. And you are exactly right. The journal editors, the grant funders, those are the places that are going to have to understand this better if um, if change is actually going to be made. So thanks for raising that very important issue. And and uh, uh, Vinod continues with, with a question. Uh, he asks how, how to convince the scientific community, uh, but, but is, is in the sequence of, of the first question. Right. So um, it's going to be a little bit of it at, a little bit of it at a time, but there's plenty of sizable research uh, are that special issue of the American statistician, that editorial that I referred to, are things that when you are working with the scientific community, when you're submitting papers, you can cite as why you are making the choices that you're making and not making different choices, because there's stuff in the literature that says, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it this way, you should be doing it a different way. So again, thanks for a very important question. Thanks, Ron. I, I have here a comment that I, I have to read. It says, uh, Bon dia. I'm enjoying this talk a lot. It's like a new cover of an old song <laughs> that needs to be song, sung every day, not only for its lyrics, but also for the wonderful uh, delivery of the performer. Yes, indeed. I think all of us uh, uh, agree with that. Well, thanks for that comment. And also, I, I have to say two things, or yeah. maybe more. Um, I love the analogy of a cover for an old song. I think I'm going to use it uh, when I give future talks on this, um, <laughs> even though I would never be singing a, any kind of song because I'm terrible at that. And also, I have to say, Isabel, that that's my granddaughter's name also. I'm very proud of that. So so thanks for your comments. Thanks. I have here also a, a question from Daniel Alba Quillan. I see it. Um, so um, I would say yes, um, that there have been similar uh, controversies. Um, there, uh, 
there was a study in particular of a, uh, a drug that is now in use um, called remdesivir, which is uh, uh, treatment. Again, it's another thing to treat people who are already like hospitalized. And the, the s- study of that was very mm-hmm. interesting because the, um, if you were, um, the more sick you were, the better it was to use that drug. Um, so if you were on a ventilator, it was m- more effective to use the drug than if you were receiving, you know, oxygen some other way, you weren't as sick, um, and, and so on. But there was a point at which um, you were still in the hospital, but you weren't as sick, where the results showed um, that uh, uh, a confidence interval showed that, you know, it, it could make you better uh, or, you know, it could show improvement or, or it could actually make you less well or less improvement, I guess I should say. I'm not saying that very well, but you get the idea. At, at some point when you weren't sick enough, it was zero was in that confidence interval. And at, at first it wasn't handled very well. It was like, well, okay, I guess we just give it to these people and these people. But the important thing was that, that it could actually be harmful to people who weren't sick enough to get it. And eventually, you know, people realized, you know, pretty quickly that we can't just look at a confidence interval like that and say zeros in the middle. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. So, um, also, if I could say just a little bit more to Daniel's uh, question, I think one of the things kind of related to statistical significance, but more related to how we do publications, uh, um, one of the things that happened in COVID times was that there was a rush to put papers out there. And so there were a lot of things that appeared that weren't peer reviewed yet. People wrote, did the paper, they put them out on a preprint server um, and the press would, would pick them up and there'd be all these articles about that or the other thing before, before the study was really fully understood. And as you can imagine, that creates a lot of confusion for people. If they see something in the news one day that says this is good and then a little bit later they see this is bad. And that happened plenty. So, um, so yes, I um, even the uh, very famous and highly renowned in this country, Anthony Fauci, misspoke about p values and statistical significance in a press conference that he gave. Yes, thank you very much, Ron. We have here a couple of more questions. I have one from uh, Rudney Fonseca. So I see it. Uh, thanks. So that's a that's a great um, uh, a great point. I do think that um, helping people understand false discovery rate would be a um, w- is a good idea. Um, the uh, so yeah, I think I think that's all I'll say. I think that's a, a, a point that people should should be aware of. And, and um, my my colleague uh, Yoav Benjamini, who you know is the I guess the the father of of false discovery rates. I'm sure would I'm sure would agree. He and I um, are are friends, but we disagree on a lot of things. But we do agree on this one. Thanks, Ron. Um, one more. Ah, so okay. Uh, thank you for this question as well. Um, I would say, and, and, and if, if you don't mind, Ron, I, I will. I will also add a, a mm-hmm. comment t- together with that. Uh, it's a comment from from Lilia uh, that that also also talks about. So maybe you, you can you can comment okay. on both. Thank you. That's that's great. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think that, um, uh, and we, we we make this point in that um, that editorial that I referred to. That we should always use multiple. M- multiple tools, multiple methods of analysis for things. So absolutely, we should um, consider uh, and, and use um, other things like Bayesian statistics at the same time. So I'm a big fan of doing that. Let me be clear. At the same time, we don't want to walk uh, into the same trap with Bayesian 
this where we get, you know, we, okay, a, um, a base factor of 6.87 or, or, or higher mean I'm good, okay? Uh, or posterior odds of this, that, or the other are the, are, are beyond a certain point are the magic thing. Um, thresholds are, thresholds are not good. Um, it, and I could make the, the same case with regards to that in, in terms of Bayesian methods, but I haven't been seeing people doing that with Bayesian methods and they do it like crazy with P values. So thanks. These are great questions. And I do have to say that I've never been on this platform before. And the fact that you can pop the questions up for the speaker like this is great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks, Ron. I think I will, I will only add one more question. Uh, I think uh, there are uh, some, some further questions, but um, I think they, the, the, they, can, they can write you directly please, by email. Please. I, I will put on this question here from, from Gelly Mesowski. So thanks for this comment, and um, I wish you uh, good luck as you continue to, um, uh, with your studies. You will, of course, um, be in classes where they tell you, you this is what you have to do. You have to um, use statistical significance to get a good grade in this class. Get a good grade in that class. But while you're at it, you might want to um, cite some literature saying, you know, there are there are there are different suggestions than just using statistical significance. So thanks for being here. Thanks for this comment, and good good luck with your studies. Thanks, Ron. Uh, I, I apologize to all other colleagues that made questions. If if you can follow up on that, you can you can write to Ron directly. Uh, Please I, do. I, I, I will I, answer you. Yes, I, I I will and and Ron will answer very quickly. Um, I, I I will end up with a question of myself. So in 2016, you had the, all this uh, this discussion or this statement and the special issue on the American statistician. Uh, is there any? Do you have any idea whether? Things have changed uh, in the use of p-values before and after that. Is there any kind of uh, of idea on, on that? So, Paulo, I actually on Monday just gave a an hour long talk on exactly that. Um, and so, when I when I come to uh, Salvador next year, mm -hmm. I can um, I can answer that question in great detail. But I will say this: there have been some changes. Here and there, some good ones, um, but we haven't gotten nearly as far as we would like to. Yes. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, so th this is already a promise. So everyone, everyone heard that it is recorded. <laughs> that, that next year you'll be here with us. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks so much. It was, for it was really you. a pleasure. It was. Uh, we have always between ninety and one hundred people uh, on YouTube. So we, we are very happy with, with your talk. Thank you very That's much. Great. That's great. And well, Paulo, take care of yourself, okay? Thanks for having me. And uh, I'll, I'll see you next year. Yes, or yes, for sure, next year. Uh, let, me, let me now tell everyone that uh, we will have now a, a 25 minutes break. And after that, we'll have the second keynote speaker, which will be João Carreira. He is... Um, is a, a research scientist at DeepMind is going to talk about gen general perception. So you are all welcome. Please don't forget, we will write down the link on, on YouTube. Uh, the link will be in a different, in a different window. Thank well, you very I'll much, send, Ron. I'll send you the slides. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.